All right, everybody, we're recording. Well, I want to welcome everybody to session 3A of the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Christina Kellum. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Library Protection Associate at the University of North Texas at Digital Libraries, and I am the Vice Chair of the Planning Committee. I'm pleased to be your session moderator for today. So first, to start some housekeeping, um, I want to acknowledge the news from Uvalde before we begin the session. I, like many of you today, are reeling from yesterday's events, and I just want you to know that we support you here every day, and especially today, and anything you're feeling right now is valid, um, and we want to encourage you to do what you need to do to take care of yourself and your loved ones. At the Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee, we are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. So we ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. Uh, you can also view our code of conduct on the tdl.org, and I'm also going to list some resources for Uvalde if you should need them in the chat. Our session is going to run until approximately 1050, so please feel free to take breaks as you need. And I invite you everybody to say hello, congratulate Alexa um, uh, in the chat. Uh, also share any resources you might find helpful. Um, and make comments throughout today's session. You're also encouraged to post your questions in the chat. We can make sure that we, as a moderator, we'll make sure these get to the, our presenters in a way that allows them to all answer questions. We will hold Q&A at the end after all of the presentations. So we're gonna go ahead and get on with the show. I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, which is Todd Peters at Texas State University. I'm gonna hand things over to him, get us started. Okay. So can uh, everybody see my screen here? Looks good, okay, well, great. So I'm Todd Peters, Head of Digital and Web Services at Texas State University, the University Libraries, and Jason Long is uh, with me and he's uh, a programmer analyst and he's here to answer some questions at the end on technical details. So this, uh, session track is called show and fail and it's new and um, I think it's an interesting idea and it's a uh, kind of a little bit um, nervous getting out here showing all your warts and stuff uh, for stuff that didn't work but I, I think our experience here with uh, machine learning um, even though it did not produce the results perhaps we wanted uh, it's still useful to uh, kind of share our experience with this. Um, so the background here, um, the background was that in 2019, Patrice Andre Prudhomme, who I think is, uh, I saw connect to the session here, he gave a presentation of some machine learning projects. And uh, that was the first time I had really seen um, the, the projects used um, machine learning tools that had become easier for non-computer scientists and uh, to use this technology. And there are some Python scripts and modules now that make it more accessible for general uh, users to try this. So we, we decided the question, well, with our limited knowledge and these tools, could we just jump into the deep end of this and actually uh, pull some metadata out of images. We have 800,000 uh, vintage San Marcos daily record photographic negatives that are not really labeled for content. So it was an idea. Can we just jump in here and do this? And here's the quick answer. No. Uh, so thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, no, just kidding. So. Um, when we got into it, first thing I discovered, there was pretty steep learning curve hardware software uh, still involved in this, just getting up and running. So your video card has to have a certain compute capability. And then there was a lot of uh, combat compatibility issues between software components, the video card drivers, which version of Visual uh, C was on the 
a computer, which version of TensorFlow worked with which version of the video drivers. And it took a while to sort all that out to get up and running. Um, fortunately, with uh, using Jupyter Notebooks and Python, you can create different environments and it makes it much simpler to play with that and do the trial and error and actually get something like that working. So uh, the first experiments I did was using the Keras Retina Net, which is an open source code. Uh, and it use, um, uses pre-trained pre -trained models ResNet. And uh, there are other pre-trained -trained models available, uh, Coco, Inception, BGG19, Exception. And so these pre-trained models are models that have been trained using uh, large numbers of very advanced computers and processors on sometimes millions of images. Um, and here's a description of the, the COCO set. And one thing to really note there is where it says the 80 object cat categories. And so these pre-trained models are limited in the number of uh, categories that they can recognize and they're trained on. And that has an impact of, of being able to use that pre-trained model on your images. So some of the problems we, you know, you run into is the inaccuracy. Um, so the error rate of what it's uh, classifying in these images is not high enough that you would have to go back and do extensive editing to use it. Uh, as I said before, categories. There's a, a narrow number of categories and sometimes they're too general. And another issue we saw was uh, these models are trained on a modern images and uh, that when you're searching and trying to classify older vintage images that can have an effect. So here's an example of just um, some of what we found in a way it was accurate, you know, it, it can in some of our images, it's person, horses. It was actually, um, there's a result here that is, uh, is accurate. However, you know, generally the metadata, you know, just trying to take it and not doing a lot of editing wouldn't be useful. So here you can see that up in that tree, there's a dog and it says that it's a bird. So, you know, that's the example of that inaccuracy that it, it finds. Um, and as I said, the categories are sometimes too general. So we, you know, we have 800,000 images. Most of them have people in it. So I'm not sure really getting a, a label person is really going to be useful for somebody trying to do discovery with those images. Uh, and another issue, like I said, the, the models are made with modern images. And so here's where it's picking up a cell phone for a little baby from the 30s and it's obviously not a cell phone. Um, so the conclusion, you know, we, we learned a lot about machine learning and the terminology and language and how to talk about it. And so our next step is, you know, now we can talk intelligently with uh, maybe people in computer science and engineering that could be partners. And so in the future, we're gonna investigate uh, maybe partnering with grad students that can kind of take it to the next level. Uh, so transfer learning uh, is uh, in machine learning. This is where you take those existing models and you train them on another step to recognize uh, maybe your buildings or people you want to recognize and it makes it more useful. And then the last thing to really point out now is that there's a lot of cloud computing sites that we initially didn't uh, really uh, pursue. Part of that is uh, the cost you pay and, and doing contracts with that. But I think I would recommend is probably experimenting with cloud computing first and not go the setting up your computer to run the uh, rest, ret, retina net or something like that. And that is my talk. Thank you so much, Todd. I'm going to hand it off now to Alexa.
Hello, everybody. My name is Alexa Height. I am the Scholarly Communication and Copyright Librarian at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. And for my show and fail today, I am talking about uh, my presentation, If You Want Something Done Right, Do It Yourself. Do graduate assistants or GAs help or hinder an institutional repository or IR projects? Um, so mine is much less technical um, and much more um, just kind of talking about staffing problems and workflows, um, training, et cetera. So the initial problem is lack of staffing. Um, like a lot of people in libraries, um, I was the only person pretty much responsible for um, ingesting, uploading, identifying materials to put into our institutional repository. Um, our institutional repository is kind of broken up into two major pieces. We have special collections and archives, um, which is handled by our special collections and archives folks. Um, they digitize things and, and born digital um, special collections and archives materials are handled by them. And then the other side of the house, we have ETDs, electronic theses and dissertations. Uh, we have two large research institutes on campus. They are very um, much self-sufficient uh, for their parts. Um, every once in a while, I might have um, some questions, you know, training new GAs in their areas. Um, or some, you know, one one off questions. Um, but for the most part, what what I'm responsible for are uploading ETDs every semester, as well as there was this desire from before my time um, starting in the position to include more green open access versions of faculty works as well as gold open access versions. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into that, uh, a lot of outreach, um, keeping track of Google Scholar citations, uh, Web of Science citations, um, in terms of then doing the outreach, contacting faculty, saying we've identified this work or these works and we'd like to put them in the in the repository, finding the appropriate format, things like that. Um, so that's kind of the background information. Uh, so in March of 2020, um, something happened and our library closed for a few months and our circulation graduate assistants didn't have work to do because they weren't running the circulation desk at the library. Um, so myself and a couple of other colleagues were kind of uh, given the GAs or, and their work um, to work on a, a backload of ETDs. Um, there's a whole other story as to why we had a backload of those, which is uh, too boring. Um, and I don't even know the full story um, because I started in early 19. Um, so we were able to do virtual training because we were all working from home and we did have because of um, past workflows and procedures, we did have a pretty decent uh, documentation of how to upload ETDs. Um, so some really good metadata guides as well as step by step going through the institutional repository to upload those IRs, uh, those ETDs into the IR, excuse me. Um, the problem uh, was probably on me um, and my colleagues, a lack or too little of training, especially regarding copyright in terms of Creative Commons licensing as well as embargoes. Um, you know, we did have virtual training sessions and we did say, you know, if you have any questions, contact us. Um, but we did have an issue where an author contacted us. Uh, their work should have had an embargo um, and it did not. Um, so it, you know, it's pretty easy to go in and fix that in your in your IR, um, add an embargo to a, to a work, but the work should have had that embargo from the start. Um, so this kind of caused worry of what else, uh, what other works don't have an embargo or what else um, has been done inaccurately. So like I mentioned, one of the challenges was lack of training. Um, those those nuances of copyright um, and then the importance of embargoes, um, as well as obviously documented workflows. Um, you know, we would do some training um, virtual uh, via chat or Zoom or whatever. Uh, I think we were out on WebEx back then. Um, but, you know, sometimes we would kind of talk about a question and then I wouldn't document it so that they had something to go back to later. Um, 
what we did learn was obviously, you know, DSpace has the option of integrating workflows. Um, so we did implement that workflow in ETDs and some other collections so that when a GA or somebody submits to the collection before it goes live, goes public, um, before Google Scholar crawls it, I can check that everything is correct. Um, you know, we had an issue where an author's name was misspelled and that you know, wasn't just in our institutional repository, but was in Google Scholar um, as misspelled. Uh, so the idea was, you know, using GAs was supposed to help lighten my workload, work on that backlog. Um, but because I have to approve every submission, you know, it doesn't always feel like it. Um, so the solution from that problem was you know, rather than having just the, the circulation GAs or after we've reopened the library in June of 2020, um, we had the reference GAs because uh, our, you know, reference stats went down. So they were working on Skullcom projects as kind of like um, if there, you know, was downtime, they could work on that. Um, but, you know, we still, <laughs> we were working on things, but it wasn't being done very accurately and they weren't always, you um, working on things um, as much or as quickly as they should be because they felt like it, they were doing me a favor rather than this was part of their job. Uh, so we did hire a full-time GA, which for GAs at our library is 20 hours a week, but they were dedicated to scholarly communication projects. Um, so they were just working on uploading things to the institutional repository, identifying works to, that could be uh, added, as well as doing that outreach, you know, um, emailing uh, faculty. Um, so, you know, we learned a lot and we've had some other one off projects. Um, in December of 21, I think I'm almost out of time. So um, briefly, we had another project where the library was closed, this time for renovations. Um, so again, I had GAs, this time different GAs, because you know we uh, our students graduate and move on, and that's wonderful. Um, but it, it happens with the problem with using GAs is it's a lot of training and a lot of turnover. Um, and so in 21, we were trying to do some metadata cleanup and we tried to use Open Refine, which of course is a great program, um, but it's kind of finicky. And I was trying to limit how much training to give the GA to do with the GAs. Um, so I tried to just give them a spreadsheet rather than having them export the metadata themselves. But of course, if they're not using, you know, the right spreadsheet, opening it correctly and saving it correctly, you can't then put it back into the IR. And so I was redoing their work again. Um, so the problem there, of course, is like not enough time to actually fully train them on how to use the re repository in terms of metadata cleanup and how to use Open Refine. Um, and so uh, my lessons learned: document everything, workflows spend a lot of time on copyright because I've been working on copyright for several years. So, um, you know, to me, the nuances are, you know, I just understand it. Whereas, you know, GAs know that copyright is a thing and that's about it. So trying to um, help them understand Creative Commons licensing takes a lot of time um, and, and repetitive, uh, you know, talking about different cases and things like that. Document everything and then prioritize because what I learned, especially in December of 21 was, does this need to get done now? Or am I just trying to give them busy work, um, which ends up being more work on me. So rather than saying, you know, my supervisor said, hey, I have GAs, do you have projects for them that could help you? In the end, I should have said, no, if you have other projects, go ahead and do that. Um, and then my third lesson learned is just advocate for more. Um, having those GAs that first time around demonstrated that we needed full-time dedication to the IR. Um, and now we have um, opened up a staff search for a full-time staff person to help us with the IR. Um, I'll take any questions after our third presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Alexa. It's good to learn. I'm going to share my screen to share a video with y'all for our third presentation with Shelley and Kimberly. Welcome everyone to When You Say Nothing At All, User Experience and Digital Collections. We're so happy to have you with us this morning. I'm Shelley Barba, the Digital Scholarship Librarian here at Texas Tech University, and I'm joined by... I'm Kimberly Vardaman, User Experience Librarian. And today we are going to be talking about Texas Tech's 
SAVE, our streaming audio and visual experience program. In 2014, TTU librarian La Yang and a group of programmers developed a streaming media player specifically to restrict access to the School of Music's graduate and faculty recital recordings. The system also enabled users to search and browse the collection. Now, this uh, system went live in December of 2015 and was promoted for patron use the following year. However, La, the project owner, left the university that spring and the program kind of languished. We found out later that when the library's website had a server migration in August of 2017, it had broken all of the links to our system from DSpace and our library's webpage. Embarrassingly, we didn't realize this until about September of 2019 during a department meeting. Needing to reconcile while no one had put in a ticket or let us know that the system wasn't working, Digital Resources reached out to our library user experience department to develop and study uh, to develop a study to address the issues we knew about, but also why the music faculty and students were not using this product. We had many a hopes and dreams <laughs> with this study and rather high expectations. First and foremost, we wanted to understand what the music folks needed from the recitals for teaching and their research and just to better understand their experiences and then make our decisions based on that data. We were really hoping for that coveted feedback of, we love this collection, just fix this one thing and then we'll use it all the time. <laughs> The second thing is we were wanting the graduate recitals to be better accessible because of our own musical interests. Um, throughout my department and also Kimberly, we love music. We love playing music and we have known some of these faculty members since we ourselves were children. The third thing that we were really hoping for and um, dreaming about was getting to work with our good work friends. Um, Kimberly and I communicate well and this project would go swimmingly and be a win not only for digital resources and now knowing what to do, but also for user experience because we were fully committed to doing whatever UX advised us to do. But <laughs> we faced a turning point and a few obstacles with this project. So at the beginning of 2020, after we had applied for and received IRB approval, the Dean of Libraries said it wasn't a good time to draw attention to this system. Uh, the Dean said that the School of Music wasn't a good place to have a failure, and so she asked us to delay the project. And this was unusual because she wouldn't usually have that oversight on most research projects, but because the user experience department and I directly report to her, uh, this political issue came up. And then next, we unexpectedly changed priorities. So we had some staff turnover and that caused work duties to shift and as well as uh, we needed to make time for rehiring. We had some personal emergencies and we were also forced into remote work, which impacted everyone. Uh, next, we had other UX projects that uh, related to a more general audience. Save was a special collection with a niche audience. So that was a different um, take for us. And so not only were we working with a smaller target user group, but we were also exploring questions that were harder for us to conceptualize. So trying to assess a product like laptop checkout and whether it's functional or not is certainly less complex than trying to understand people's behaviors and needs, why they do what they do. We were asking questions in this project of uh, things like, how would you listen to recitals? Why would you listen to recitals? Much more complex. And then finally, the pandemic affected our research practice, so we had to pivot to Zoom interviews and digital recruiting. We found that people had a lower bandwidth for extra projects, and the in-person UX cafe sessions that we usually have with coffee and snacks are more inviting than yet another Zoom meeting. So how our study failed uh, participation definitely fell short of expectations. So for context, we typically would want 5 to 15 participants for usability research, 
And on this project, we hoped for 10 to 20 participants for our UX interviews. And we did want to hear from both faculty and graduate students, um, but sadly, we only had three faculty join us for interviews. Among the recruiting strategies that we tried, we had an email that went out from the library's School of Music liaison to all faculty. We sent targeted email invitations to people we knew personally. We did snowball sampling. So this is asking the participants we did have to recommend other people who might participate. And then after returning to campus, we posted flyers in the student union building and the music building. And then there was also a last stitch post to the university's email notification system or tech announce. So everyone at our university received the message about our project. So while we expected low participation, only three is extremely low. We did have some takeaways and lessons learned. And at first, we realized that if the libraries had been able to do user research at the outset before developing SAVE, we might have known that the collection served a different purpose than what we in the libraries expected. Um, however, the UX department didn't exist before uh, 2016 when this uh, development happened. Uh, and you know, if we had done this re user research, we might have also known that the collection wasn't as essential for music faculty's research and teaching as we thought it was. Next, I'm confident that some incentive would have been helpful to get more research participants. Uh, it is difficult on our campus to get budget and other support for paying research participants. Um, there's a comparison project that comes to mind that was grant funded. It was at the same time as the SAVE project, but because of the grant, we were able to offer $20 gift cards and that project had 32 participants, so big difference. And then finally, Asking for user feedback is still valuable, even if they don't verbalize anything to you. We could check our own assumptions about how the collection is valued. Now for digital resources, with the report that we received from user experience, uh, we're able to move forward with our save. And our main takeaways that are guiding us in going forward is one, Recognizing that stakeholders may not be who you expect them to be and then being open to them changing. In just talking about the failure and frustration of this study, I found other more invested stakeholders in the graduate school's compliance department. And we have uh, new stakeholders now, a, a new department chair for the School of Music and a new library music liaison who's had very recent experience in actually being a graduate student here at our School of Music. The uh, other thing is we are now realizing that we would get more buy-in by focusing on the intake of recitals and improving that workflow and outreaching to current graduate students as they were working on their degrees to get them interested in using the recital repository as well. And finally, we wanted to match, um, we need to match the energy with what is actually needed. Uh, so making minor changes to save instead of completely throwing it out and now concentrating on core functions that are needed, not the frills or extras, the gilding of the interface. So with that, um, if you want to do a similar uh, user experience project, we highly suggest this really good UX resource of the Nielsen Norman Group that has practical user-friendly guidance for getting started with user research. Uh, we have a link here and we also wanted to acknowledge that our presentation templates are, is from Slides Carnival. They are free and very awesome. Thank you so much uh, for your time and attention this morning. If you'd like to discuss more about either user experience studies and digital collections or what your school of music is doing in regards to recitals, please feel free to contact me uh, via email at shelly.barba at ttu.edu. And we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you all so much. We're ready to open the floor for any questions. You're free to unmute or ask them in the chat. Monica already on the board has some questions for our Texas Tech folks. Uh, what methods uh, did you use for promoting the collection? 
That is an excellent question, Monica. Um, and going back, because I was not a part of the project when it originally launched in uh, 2015, early 2016, uh, there was some outreach to our School of Music via um, our project manager and our music liaison at that time. Uh, but other than that, it was some links on the website and linking it through our DSpace um, instance. And so if a, a student uh, graduated who had uh, audio recordings, there would be a link going that way. So if they were looking for the viola sonata, that link would take them that way. The, Susan has a question for Alexa. Um, what academic departments did your GAs come from? And uh, did that make a difference? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, we've had, so my, my current dedicated GA just works on Skullcom IR projects. He is actually a computer science GA. Um, so I do think that that helps with understanding the importance of accurate metadata. Um, our, our circulation and reference GAs tend to come from English, history, a lot of counseling. Um, so they're they're often really great at those circulation and reference interactions. They, they definitely have more um, customer service. Um, but in terms of, uh, yeah, understanding the nuances of copyright and, and accuracy of meta, metadata, I do, I do think that that makes a difference. So that's a really good question. Uh, yes, I had a, a question for Alexa too um, uh, about um, uh, do you guys use um, uh, Vireo? That is a good question. We actually do not use Vireo. We use ProQuest um, Administrator. Okay. And so that actually also is, it has been a um, just another challenge, I would say, um, because we are using graduate students um, to upload ETDs, they are still, they're not given access to the ProQuest administrator website. So when we do, um, and, and our institution also, the ETDs are the the publishing of ETDs from the student's perspective and through ProQuest is handled from the College of Graduate Studies side of things. Um, so they will let me know when they've been sent to ProQuest and when they've been published. And then I will go in um, and download the final published version as well as the report, which gives us the, the necessary metadata. Um, and so that's that's another part of if we had a full time staff person, um, you know, it could be much more hands off on it as well. Um, so that that is a good question. Uh, we did have, you know, Christian and Courtney came pre pandemic and, and gave a presentation on Vireo and our College of Graduate Studies just didn't want to go for it. I think they're comfortable with the way ProQuest works at this point. And then we have another question for Todd. Have you tried using ML? for text mining of example ETDs? Uh, no, we have not done a formal project um, with that. We've, we've experimented with um, with Python, the, uh, the natural language toolkit, you know, is um, with Python to do some text um, ex extraction, particularly uh, after we joined Hottie Trust and the ex extended features data set and Kind of playing around with learning uh, to do some of the the text mining, but we haven't actually done any project with our uh, theses or dissertations or anything. Let's see. Elliot has another question for you, Todd. Uh, do you think there is a possibility for collaboration across libraries and archives to train a model that would work on the kinds of materials that our institutions hold? And could that help with some of the issues you experienced? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I could see that. You know, like I said, one of the issues with um, the, the models, the pre-trained models, was being trained on modern images and uh, 
color images and that that does make a difference when trying to do the classification on black and white or grayscale images um, so I, you know i could see that may possibly uh trying to do um some training on more typical images found in in archives I wanted to ask Alexa, where did you have, have you had any other success? Have you had any success working with cheese <laughs> that you think was great? I mean, I, yes, of course. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, yes, I think the, I think the, the fail part of, of all of this has been on, on my end of things um, in terms of, you know, I have had kind of piecemeal um, training myself on the institutional repository, and it's kind of kind of just a, a trial and error, um, trying to to figure things out. And then, a, because you know, I I wasn't the person responsible for uploading the ETDs. It was it was it just like kind of kept changing departments within the library, um, and. And so I think it was it was very much, you know, they were they were doing what they were told with, you know, some minor errors, it, but it was on me for not training them well enough in the first place um, and probably not having the foresight to just implement the um, workflows in DSpace from the beginning and just having that I'm going to check everything, um, at least at the beginning. Um, and, and so I think that that was, you know, one of the biggest challenges, but of course, you know, they, they're lovely to work with. And I think, you know, another part of it also um, is what I think a lot of people experience where managing the repository is only one part of my job. Um, I'm also um, a liaison and do instruction and reference. And so um, it's great to have them helping me, but it's not like I'm just doing repository work. So when they're submitting things, it's just part of what I'm doing in terms of the repository. Um, cause you know, I'm also doing all these other things and committee work and all that. So, um, I think it's just a, you know, normal challenge of working in libraries. It was also my first experience, um, doing kind of project management in that way, as well as supervising, um, you know, if worked with student workers and, and graduate assistants before, but not been their direct supervisor or the, the one directing the projects. Um, so it was just a whole learning experience for me. And I've learned a lot. So it wasn't, you know, a total failure. We did get a huge backload of ETDs worked on and we've just had to um, go back and fix some some things as well and find we found gaps when we were our special collections folk were cataloging the print um, theses and dissertations and they were finding that not all of them were actually in the institutional repository and I still have no I and these are from 2019 <laughs> still have no idea how those got missed or like what if they were published late and so it was just like in running the report of what needs to be uploaded you know I did 2020 um because I thought all of 2019 had been published and we just didn't didn't check those gaps so yeah it was a lot of learning yeah well also you know it was um, the, the project itself was made because of the pandemic yeah so there is also the added stress of trying to work through that exactly yes yeah and the GAs you know the circulation and reference GAs were hired to do one thing and then we told them you're going to be doing working on this project as well which was you know very new to them and in my opinion DSpace is not very intuitive um and so just being like you know, without them understanding the full picture of how DSpace works and what what's going on and what metadata is and, and all of that, I think, you know, it's just a failure on my part. I don't think so. I think it was a learning experience. It was, it, of course. Point of the show yes. and fail. <laughs> Every failure is a learning experience, yes. It means that when we get small, small little projects, we kind of have a better understanding of how to teach it and also understanding like end point end goals.
anybody's interested, Susan is very, is gonna, is all about collaboration on some text mining, I see. <laughs> Do we have any other questions for our presenters? I'd like to open it up to our presenters ourselves. Is there anything that you'd like to add that was from your presentations that you feel like maybe you want to have one more moment to say or have an update on? Like, how's music? How are you going to do those? <laughs> We're working on it. Um, that's actually, good enough right yeah, yeah we actually um uh, have about probably i'd say an 18 month maybe two year that's finger crossed what's time anymore no one can say um plan on um updating save and putting some new recitals in there as well linking it to dspace in a different way um we're we're experimenting right now with a different workflow as i mentioned of receiving recitals that um of not of actually kind of going around Vireo um, because we're now to the point where students aren't sending me um, audio clips, they're sending video clips that are like 60 gigabytes big. And so that's breaking Vireo and not working, but we're working on that and going around. So um, I have a lot of hope that maybe at next TCDL, I will present a poster or something about what, um, how that's going and updates on that, but just um, really about like matching that energy of what the music school do and only really kind of do that, not not go, not break my back um, or our collective backs on it, even though it could be really fun. We don't have the time or the money to do that uh, right now. Um, but I did, I did want to say um, that I'm actually super appreciative of TCDL doing the show and fail format. Um, my favorite presentations are when things don't go right and people talk about it because um, it seems then more realistic um, to go forward and not just like the Facebook highlight reel um, that a lot of presentations can be. And so I'm very appreciative of that and of um, uh, Todd and Alexa also sharing with that. Um, I think there's like really good value in talking about when things don't go as you plan. Yeah, I think the fact that we get to show what we've worked on that didn't work out, that is not usually documented, but is so important to our jobs. Um, we, always, we all have failed projects, or at least projects that are slower than we would like and therefore are failing because it looks like nothing's moving. And it's hard to convince your boss that it's like, no, no, it's moving. We're working on it. We just, I only have an hour a week to work on this. Yeah, it's hard to keep momentum with those, you know, like not, not as successful projects. Um, I appreciated, um, Elaine Westbrook's talk, I mean, her presentation was on something very different, but that idea of like, we have, you know, small movements on our institutional repository projects and, and you know, getting more people involved and um, more things added. And, and so sometimes it can be like a lot of outreach and a lot of communication and not a lot of, not, not a lot of um, nothing to show for it. Um, you know, I've started collections for people because we're going to get like first year seminar projects. Um, you know, their posters into the repository and then they never get submitted. So the collection sit, sits empty and then we delete it. And it was like, that was a lot of back and forth with the program coordinators that just, you know, we have nothing to show for it. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Like you just, yeah, what you're saying, Christina, like baby steps. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. Of course, if you have any other questions that you have for the presenters, feel free to email them or start a discussion with them and any in any of the platforms that you feel is necessary. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.